I will stand with my last breath and say, if you don't think that it's possible, as all things with God are possible, if you don't think it's possible, that we can regain our nation and regain our stand and regain our God-given rights that we have been granted that are slowly ebbing and being taken away, well, then I have news for you. God's not the God that the Bible says he is because it says with God all things are possible. Ephraim and Manasseh are, um, they are the children of Joseph. Joseph is one of the children, immediate children of Jacob, Israel. Except we know that from the record given to us in the Bible, these are children that were born in Egypt because Joseph was in Egypt, in prison, and then elevated to uh, a position. They were born in Egypt, and they were born by uh, an Egyptian woman. So we have a mixed marriage that produces these children. And at the close of the book of Genesis, we have the patriarch, Jacob, Israel, who is now going to bestow blessings or pronouncements on all of his children. Some of them are basically more like analysis or statements. Some of them are blessings. Interesting that Jacob Israel blesses the children of Joseph, that is Ephraim and Manasseh, and puts them in the position of basically firstborn. He takes them and adopts them as though they are his firstborn children. And if you know the story, you know that the firstborn of all of his children defiled his father's bed. So that basically negated him. And there's a whole series of things. If you read in Genesis, you'll find why we get down to these children of Joseph being put basically into the first position, receiving the birthright blessing. Because the, the blessings that were passed on when it was just uniquely to one child. So that terminus ends, by the way, between the two children of Esau and Jacob, because we know that Esau sells his brother Jacob, who's not yet Israel, his birthright blessing. So thus far, not a problem, because it's all vested in individual children. But now we have many children. So this blessing package is separated from birthright, that is what we call complicated word, the law of primogenitor, the law of firstborn, and other blessings that would be put on or bestowed upon the other children. So interesting, we know that um, Jacob Israel does something very typical of the Bible. He takes the children and he blesses them. But what he does is he blesses the younger child bestowing on him essentially what should have been bestowed upon the firstborn Manasseh. He bestows upon the younger Ephraim. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're looking at each and every tribe. And um, what is interesting here, we are trying to figure out what happened to these people. As I said, we followed, and you'll hear me, you'll hear me repeat this later, but we followed, for example, the tribe of Dan. And the tribe of Dan, we know, ultimately settles in the area of Ireland, uh, the British Isles, and ultimately in Ireland. Not before, if you follow the pattern, they set off, it's Greece, and then Turkey, Greece, and then ultimately Ireland. And we see a lot of the places in between that bear their names, Dan, Denmark, Denmark, Denmark. Uh, a lot of the Din, Don, if you look at the map, belong to the tribe of Dan. We followed many of these tribes to where they would ultimately uh, plant their heels, at least for a time. If you remember, we looked at Reuben, who settles in a portion of what is a portion of France. So each and every one of these becomes important for a reason. We're not just doing this as an exercise to uh, explore the map, but because ultimately, if you're concerned about the future, and I am concerned about the future, the, the future of where we are right now in this world and prophecy that concerns the future, one must have a good grasp of what it means, which places will be active in terms of called out and basically participating in God's plan 
towards the end versus those territories that will be hostile and will be against basically God's final plan to make that last call for people to answer and hear the message one last time before God says, time's up. So there's a lot of reasons to map this out properly. And something else, we can see something that I pointed out now, I believe, several times. Had God not scattered all of these tribes, you wouldn't hear Jesus saying, but I say unto you, and he says basically to go unto the lost house of Israel. We kind of gloss right over that. So it's very interesting that if you kind of see all the pieces come together, many of these nations that are the scattered people will become basically the foundation of Christendom, at least in its genesis. And that becomes really important. It's God's way of accomplishing his plan without basically putting every detail down in front of us, and yet he did it. So uh, there's a lot of good reasons to explore this. But I'm going to take you first to something that is said to Jacob, who has not yet become Israel. I pointed this out last week. I'd like to reread it. It's in Genesis 35 and verse 11. And actually, here's a perfect place, because this will answer the question for those who are not familiar. In verse 10, just the verse before, God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So right there we have the name change that should answer the question for those that are confused. Verse 11 says, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation. And a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Now, there have been interpretations on this verse, a nation and a company of nations. And I want to point something out, so bear with me, because this part may be a little bit confusing. We tend to make this, extrapolate from this, if you know teaching on the lost tribes, we tend to extrapolate a nation and a company of nations being Ephraim and Manasseh. But I want you to bear with me. There may be more than one meaning here, and I say that with all due respect. I don't mean to step on anybody's toes, but think of it this way. If, if uh, as we shall see, Ephraim becomes somewhat of a collective along the way, scooping up many, unbeknownst to them, many of their former brethren along the way as they move west, we may understand a company of nations correlated to Ephraim, and I'll explain as I go. Um, it may also have a double meaning, so I, I don't want to be too quick to solidify this, but for this message today, I'm looking at a nation and a company of nations because we're on the subject of Ephraim. I'm going to use the traditional meaning. At a later message, I will explain what I said about a double meaning, so just bear with me. Uh, but several things are said, a nation, a company of nations, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So we know the northern tribes were deported by the Assyrians in several successive waves, placed in different buffer zones. Uh, we have scriptural reference to where they, some of them were dropped in Hala, Hebor, and Gozan. Um, and it kind of just sum up the area. If you open up a map, you look at the, the area of the Caspian Sea. I know this is very generic, but I'm trying to keep it that way for the benefit of all. The Caspian Sea, the Zagros Mountains, that general area, all right? And if you look at a map, you could probably even look a little bit closer. Media, Parthia, those areas are where a lot of these people were dumped into. And of course, there's, as I said, there are many things that ensue. It's not just that they got bored at where they were and started to migrate. There were many other things that happened in the process, which I have not covered yet. But if you recall, in some of those messages, uh, probably in the earlier messages, I mentioned a people called the Scythians. And this is where I need to start tying things together. Because to now, we've been able to look at a lot of these tribes, and we've been able to identify specific people. Um, but the group of Scythians is so 
it's kind of a big group, and it's got many subcategories. I think it might have been the message that I delivered as a remote um, on the subject of those wandering through India and China, uh, that there were specific names to those Scythian people, and they were known as Saka Scythians, but with specific names and specific garb. I don't know if you remember that. So here, what we're going to encounter in this message is a peppering of Scythian people, which are none other than some of the portion of the northern lost tribes, all right? And people might say, well, how come they didn't retain their name? How come they didn't keep their name? Well, I want you to look at it this way. Um, see how easily things happen, how people forget real quickly. You ever see those videos lately of man on the street where they ask young people about, you know, like directly, when was the war of 1812? And uh, <laughs> kind of like that, right? So it's very easy for people if their history is not passed on, especially if they're separated from their tribal leaders over time to lose their identity, which is exactly what happens. But make no mistake, imagine a vast group of people that is basically deported out of that land, the northern kingdom, dumped into the lands I've just described, and within probably a generation and a half become known by other names. And they are the names they did not name themselves, but their captors or their, deport, their deportees or deporters basically put upon them. And they were referenced that way. And the names, for many and most part, stuck. And we've got good evidence of that. If you look at the Biestun Rock, there are many of these that call these people. This is where we get the identification of the Saka Sunni or the Scythian people, primarily from a lot of these heathen historical, archaeological finds that explicitly say these people and explain who these people are, sometimes referred to by many different names, but never specifically by the names they were formerly known as. So that's kind of important. Uh, another group of people commingled within this message, and I'm only going to say this once, uh, aside from the Scythians, are the Sumerians, C. I M M, not Sumerians, not Chimerians, Sumerians. And we're going to talk, we're going to say for right now that these two branches of people are closely related. They are indeed brethren, but by the time their names have stuck, they don't know that they're brethren anymore, all right? It's kind of like the state we find ourselves in today. You'd be surprised. I, I, I'm not a betting person, but if I was, I bet you that just right in this room right here, we could probably find at least one or two people that by at least some form of removal by cousin or are related, and you don't even know it. Or if we could trace back your lineage, that's how closely woven we are. I know it's kind of like, I don't like that idea. <laughs> but that's how closely woven this whole thing is. Um, now, in the subgroup of Saka people within this cluster of Ephraim. We encounter people called the Humvashaka, and we know that these people are directly tied into the tribe of Ephraim. We know that. Beyond that, I'm just going to leave that as a piece of information. You can do whatever you want with. Um, but here's what's fascinating. Each and every message, I've taken you into the genealogies, and I've showed you that you've got the tribal name. OK, so let's take the easy one, Dan. And then it lists the offspring. And I use this because it's an easy one. Dan only has one offspring listed, Hushim. And of course, we try and dissect who, or it's either who that Hushim became, or a land that was named after them. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to have you turn to Numbers 26, uh, 2635 first. So these are the sons of Ephraim after their families of Shul'ila, Shuth'ila, the family of, bear with me, Shula, Shulahites, I'm sure that's not the way to pronounce it, of Bishr and the family of Bachorites, of Tahan, and the family of Tahanites, 
And these are the sons of Shuth Elah, of Aaron and the family of Aaronites. And these are the families of the sons of Aaron according to those that were numbered. And it gives the number at the time that a census was taken. I'm not interested in that today. There is a second reference, genealogical reference, and that is in 1 Chronicles 7. I just want you to take a look at it because these are quite detailed. And then we're going to go back and just look at the little bit of information given to us that we just read in Numbers. But I want you to take a look at this. So the sons of Ephraim, and here we go again, Shulia Shuth Elah, and Bered, which is also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is also Beecher. I think there's, they're one and the same. Um, his son, Taha, uh, his son, Ilada, his son, Taha, his son, Zabad, his son. And so you kind of get, you see all of the descendants being listed here. Um, verse 22, Ephraim, and Ephraim, their father, mourned many days. Why? We, we, uh, you can see that the verse before it says, those that were born, um, whom the men of Gath that were born in the land slew because they came down to take away their cattle. So Ephraim, their father, mourned many days. His brethren came to comfort him. When he went to his wife, she conceived, bare a son. He called his name Bariah because uh, it went evil in his house. So you have the whole list here giving you an idea of the whole family. And I don't want to spend the time to read. I just, in your own time, you can take a look at this. But it's to give you an idea. God somehow lets this all be recorded. And you might think, what's the point? I'll show you the point. So if you, you want to turn back, you could stay where you are. You can turn back to numbers with me if you want. But let's start with some obvious stuff here, uh, where it says in Numbers 26, listing uh, Beecher and the family of Bachrites. You know, because my mind is wired this way, the minute I looked at that, I didn't even have to look it up. Uh, this sounds very familiar with Bactria. And of course, if you know your geography, you know darn well that that's pretty close to the area that they were dumped into. So uh, there is a correlation there of that place. You can put a note somewhere because it all becomes important. Um, we know, by the way, that if we were looking at just the Saka Scythian people, we know that they were in that area. Again, known by another name, but same people, all right? And if you keep going, you'll find that uh, these folks who are descendants of this one individual who perhaps that place is named after, Bactria, eventually develop and will keep going to see that the Saka Scythians become the Saka Saxons, which become the Angles, which become the Anglo Saxons, which become the English people, okay, from England. Yeah, that's like, what a stretch. I don't know if that was a sneeze or what a stretch. Okay, <laughs> so there's that. Then you look at the next one, and that next one after Beecher is Tahan of the Tahanites. And this one, this one may be a shocker because we have history recorded one way, but this Tahan is none other than, and don't, if you know history, don't close your mind off to this. These are the Teutons, or the Teutons, not as we have traditionally understood a German group of people. No, these are part of this tribe. And again, if you know a little bit of history and geography, you find that this cluster of people, basically all of these clans, will end up in that certain geographical area that I just talked about, Bactria, close to Parthia. Um, one more that will give you insight here. Um, the mention of, in verse 36, of Aaron and the Aaronites, and I pointed this out previously. Aaron is very closely related to two different names. Aaron, E-R-I-N, which will be the nomenclature, the place known eventually as Ireland. But here, this name will be associated with a place you have all heard of before, 
Iran before it became Iran. I, I hate to pronounce it like that from this name in all of this geographical area belonging to this individual. And there's a whole development of these places based on these names. So you have to imagine, this is not limited to just this tribe, that it seems like everywhere these people went, they like to put their name down like claiming a territory. Kind of very interesting to me. Um, so that really brings me to the last but not least uh, there is a Beecher, which if you look in your margin, well, that would be in verse 35, and I think my Bible has a variation of that. Beecher is also Bered. Um, but interesting that these people are found within the Goths. So now we know there's, there's been a crossover between tribes known as the Borad or the Boradi. So, you know, when we talk about where, do, where did people come from, where are their origins, where did they emanate from, you're, you don't actually think that you could get the clues for that, but they're in this book. And that's what's so fascinating to me. See, when people say, oh, I, you know, when you get back to regular Bible teaching, I'll, I'll come back to listen. Are you nuts? I'm, I'm actually showing you God's hand in history without there being a specific something listed there to show you how amazing when God said he would scatter. And these people basically, as I said, lose their identity, but they leave their names. They are, these are probably the first uh, clan leaders that embed their name. And then we're talking about generations later become, they don't know who they are. They become a clan of something else. They intermarry, they mix. Tribes will merge, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, so the big question that people have is, well, how do we get, if you're saying that these people will become Britain, England, how do we get there? How, how does all of this morph? Where does the name come from? And I think I alluded to this last week. Um, the prophet Hosea writes, Ephraim is a heifer. And by the way, this, in this case, referring, I believe, to the collective, not to the individual tribe. But Ephraim is a heifer. That word in the Hebrew, egla or engla, Jeremiah calls Ephraim a bullock. Same Hebrew word. And if you recall, Joseph was likened to a bull. These are all the same. They all, it's a very difficult way to try and get to make this clear, but the Hebrew has a letter that could be e or a, but it looks like ingle or angle. So we would anglicize that as angle. And as I mentioned last week, we know when we talk about the French referring to England, it's called Angleterre, Angle, Angle, like as in Anglo. So there is this connection to these words. It's just not random. Um, so these people, for the sake of this message today, are known as Ogli, Engel, Ogle, but ultimately it will be anglicized as Anglo. So there you go. These people will inhabit, as I said, portions of Parthia, Bactria. Uh, look at a map, and I always say look at an older map, because it's going to shock some of you. If you haven't taken my suggestion to look at an older map, just Google an older map. I'm talking about older. You're going to see the area I'm talking about, and right above it on an older map, you're going to see Saka, a large swath of land called Saka. In fact, Adjacent to it, you're going to see Samar, Samarkland, similar to Samaria, right? So all of these things, I'm sorry, there's not an accident, it's not a coincidence, but when we're doing this type of tracing, you, you can really see God's hand in history, and it's unbelievable. I feel sorry for people who, A, don't believe, and who don't believe the Bible because there's so much information in here that we, if we didn't have DNA testing, if we didn't have a lot of stuff, we could piece together on our own. Just give me a map and let me point it out to you and it becomes abundantly clear, especially when we know where they were deposited and where they began to migrate. So we saw this, as I said, with Dan going to ultimately ending up in, in Ireland, Denmark, Ireland, Asher and Naphtali making up the Vandals and the Goths, 
the Norwegians. Uh, if you recall, we looked in the book of Judges, we saw Asher, the reference of breaches, which in the Swedish Bible is where we get our word for Viking. Uh, the Vikings, the Geats, the Picts, the Frisians, the Jutes, and the list goes on. And these are all foundational peoples of the British Isles for the most part and uh, other parts of Europe, of course. Uh, so good idea for us, as I said, to put this all together. And as I said, we have the two brothers. Ephraim is the younger. And remember, I referenced this not randomly, nation and company of nations. So when people say, is this reference to England and America? Well, we know one thing. America was never and has never been a company of nations. It's a singular nation, although it doesn't look like it right now. It's a singular nation, OK? But we do know that England was a company of nations. And uh, very easy for us to see if you know your history. In 1897, Queen Victoria, at the height of her reign, the kingdom at that time, the uh, British Empire, spanned something like 11 million square miles. By 1993, that extended to 13.9 million square miles, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, places like India, obviously Africa. Uh, the span, the scope of a comp that really does fit the bill of a company of nations. That's a large body of people. Now, they do not all belong to the tribe of Ephraim, but they came under that banner. That becomes important for our understanding. Um, after 1815 and the Napoleonic Wars, that comes to a conclusion. We see the British Empire basically at the height of their power, and that will last a little less than two centuries. And then we have a very interesting uh, history woven together that brings us back People don't understand how intricate things are tied together. And because a lot of people don't know their history, they end up saying, well, why, why do we meddle? Why are we involved with Israel? And why, is, why did Britain get involved with Israel? Well, again, you've got to know the history. You've got to know this background that we're looking at, and you've got to know history. Um, so we know, for example, and I've previously mentioned this in another, mention, another message, uh, it was in 1917 that the Foreign Secretary, uh, James Balfour, writes to one of Britain's most famed citizens, Baron Rothschild, expressing, expressing the British government's support for the establishment of the Jewish homeland in Palestine. Ask yourself the question, just ask this one question, why would England put its nose into that land full of conflict, full of divisiveness. Why? And there's good reason to go back, probably unbeknownst to any of these people, like people that are being moved like chess pieces by the hand of God. Why? Because somewhere in this woodpile, Ephraim's identification with that land as brethren, I'm talking about way back, becomes clear. No other land no other country got involved in this initially. Uh, it was England or Britain driving for this British support to keep the movement going. And as you know, the letter that was written eventually becomes known as the Balfour Declaration. And a lot of issues that happened in between, obviously, there was before the First World War and then the bookend of that, the Second World War. And by the close of the Second World War, we see two things. England is basically broke and needs the help of its brother, the United States. And two, the formation of that state of Israel in 1948. But it took something. It took the British power, that British force, so just think of that. You know, people think it's a random thing. It was not a random thing. And you can be uh, anti, for, or against. It doesn't matter. When you start to see that somewhere God was orchestrating the pieces, that it had to come from a place that could have come from America, but we were not involved. 
and we wouldn't have been involved had it not been for England wanting this and pressing for it. So just put that one down somewhere as not a coincidence. And you'll see, by the way, when we get into looking at the brother Manasseh, you will see how tightly woven this all is. So when people say, well, why do we bother with Israel? Now, first, let me get this straight. Everything that has happened in modern history, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it, it's like a bookmarker required to keep the page until God is ready to do something with it. So you can talk about the statehood, you can talk about whether people, the Palestinians, the Arabs are angry or the Jews are mad, it doesn't matter. You can talk about all the folly that's happened there of all the different people who've occupied before the Balfour Declaration was enforced, how many people basically possessed and took over that land and claimed that land. And yet somehow, if you think about it, some of the world's history's most brutal people took over that land. How is it that England intervened and made that connection for that to happen? And don't say, well, it was for the Jewish state to become what it is. No, I'm telling you something necessary as a bookmarker, otherwise that land would have been completely converted into Arab territory completely, not letting the fulfillment of this book and all the prophecies for the future come to pass. There must be another temple built there, and the temple must be built by certain people. The, 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 the final temple will not be built by Arabs, it will not be built by other people. So that's what I'm saying to you when I say bookmark. It's like God saying, okay, this is the stake in the ground. Hold the fort until I'm ready to come back and do what only I can do. And if you look at even some of the, what I call the antics, you know that the Arab Muslims were so frustrated with situations there, you know that they were fearful, although they don't, by the way, they don't believe that Jesus is anything, but he was just a prophet of the likes of Muhammad. But nevertheless, they sealed up that gate and put a cemetery in front of it, just to make, just almost like an insurance, just to make sure maybe if this Jesus thing is true, he won't be able to come through a sealed rock wall. <laughs> wow, that's good thinking for you. That's food for thought, right? So, let me move on now. Um, you heard me reference from Hosea and from Jeremiah and the blessing on Joseph about this bull, right? So don't you think it's odd that we have a caricature? Now, most of us here in this country wouldn't maybe be familiar, but look it up on your own and you'll see what I'm talking about. If you put John Bull, who is the caricature, England's caricature, if you will, uh, depicted as wearing a waistcoat with the Union Jack. Um, we have just a little bit later, Uncle Sam come on the scene. You're gonna see some, not, not so much, but yes, there are similarities there. And that's why I said to you, unmistakable that there is a connection there we have to look at. But I'll, get, I'll come back to that. I'll circle back to the, the uh, concept of John Bull in a second. The important thing I wanna talk to you about is when you start trying to connect the dots and you realize, you know, maybe somebody says, well, I, I don't know about all the names and the places you gave. Well, try this one on for size because I, I delivered this in a previous message. In 1103 BC, Brutus, Brutus the Trojan, lands in the British Isles, which was called Albion at the time, and names the land after himself, Brut, Brutan, Brut, it becomes Britain, named out in 1103 BC, mind you, okay? And we know when we look at that, and this is old school for a lot of you old timers, when we look at the name British Britain, Brit goes, takes you back to Hebrew, Brit, covenant, and Ish is Hebrew for man, so British, covenant man, or if you want Britain, Brit, covenant, and Am, Hebrew for people which becomes an N, not an M. So you tell me how this is all not connected. And if you can explain that to me, I'm willing to listen to you, but I'm telling you what is the obvious. 
Um, we also have some other interesting factoids that are always skewed by historians. So remember, I just finished telling you about the importance of the spread of Christianity. If you are reading secular records, and I roll my eyes at this, most um, attribute Christianity being brought to England by St. Cuthbert. Well, I got bad news for all y'all that read that stuff. That's really just the worst thing that you could read because it tells me you don't read the Bible and you don't know a thing about the historical record. Joseph of Arimathea, the rich ruler who begged for the body of Christ, he was rich because he got tin from the mines at Cornwall and made many trips there. You don't think in your mind that after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ that that man did not go back to that land where his riches were and told the people there about our Lord and Savior rising from the dead and ascending and returning in the future? And that would have been just in a short period right after the events of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. That's number one. Number two, the Apostle Paul. And you can do with that whatever you want, but we know that the Apostle Paul likewise traveled a great distance and not recorded perhaps in the Bible, although there are places recorded like he was headed for Spain or he was headed for Rome, and we tend to think, oh, but it would never have been in Britain. But I could show you that and possibly will in another message. So we have good reason, plausible, substantive information that says, no, St. Cuthbert, unfortunately, was not the first person to bring Christianity there. And in fact, if you want the, the solid record that can take you back as far as what is recorded in actuality, not according to the Roman Catholic Church, you will find that in 180 AD, you've got the first record that predates any of this Cuthbert stuff that you could ever talk about. This, it, I find this very annoying when people do not record history accurately and tend to morph it to fit their agenda, which I find, especially within Christianity, quite loathsome, okay? So we know that by the year 627 AD, there was the greatest wave of Christian conversion that happened under the king of Northumbria. England was not yet united. It was all in different sections, so Wessex, Northumbria, all these different areas. So the first one was in 627. The king of Northumbria converts. Soon all of the subjects follow after that. East Anglia, after that Hampshire, Mercia, and so on. So territory by territory within what will become Angla land, which ultimately becomes England, you've got this conversion going on and it spreads. In fact, there is uh, an interesting history regarding those Danes who settled in that area and the vast amount of Viking infiltration that came who were not Christians, who thought the Christians were possessed and crazy because these people worshiped some other god, and eventually wanted to settle in that land and uh, an ultimatum is given to them that they can settle the land, but they have to convert to Christianity. So that land essentially becomes the seedbed for what will ultimately, much later down the road, become successive transformations of Christianity, first obviously with Catholicism taking its roots, and then ultimately in more modern history with the advent of Henry VIII divorcing his wife, and forming the Anglican Church, which was the antithesis, eventually, of the Roman Catholic Church. So you've got a lot of important Christianity that begins there and begins to spread. And look, remember I told you Ephraim is the younger. And it is Ephraim that goes first. And we're going to look at, as I said in the next message, we'll look at Manasseh. But if Manasseh is the United States, we know that this nation was formed later, after England. So you can begin to see a pattern of how this would all fit together. More about, we'll say, a collective, because we do know something that happened. We do know that as, going back to earlier history, as 
all of these tribal and clan people begin to move, they are swept up in a collective body. So this is why, unlike, for example, I referenced the Danes, or the tribe of Dan again. Some of these settled in the British Isles. You find a good concentration in Ireland. And ultimately, the interesting thing is, some of these will be kind of swept under the banner of Ephraim. So it's not, this is, Ephraim and Manasseh are not as cut and dry as the other tribes. And you can see when I use the word collective, how important it is to understand the total body of people that would come under that banner. Um, now, <laughs> a lot of stuff to cover here. Um, Ephraim should mean, it should be applied to Ephraim, but it, it, some have interpreted Ephraim and Manasseh being blanketed by a term that means fruitful. And if we're going to, if I'm going to go there, let me talk about Manasseh, which Manasseh means to forget or to cause to forget. You know what I think is interesting? Two nations, two, one a company of nations and the other a nation, that were founded on Christian beliefs. And they started out fruitful. And they have both become forgetful. Just look at where we are. Now, I, I think when I look at this, the thing that makes me the sickest to my stomach, looking at everything that God did to bless us. And I think about England and all the splendor that England acquired and everything, by the way, kings, when it says kings shall come out of thy loins. And I keep referencing this because there's one other part of this equation I have to now tie in here. But the blessings that were upon both of these company of nations and this nation, when people actually looked unto the Lord, which seems to be, we know for a fact that England, by the way, has been somewhat overtaken by um, a diversity of groups, but primarily one or two groups that have basically become the majority in that land, so Christianity is no longer the main religion. And here we have succumbed to the ideology that, uh, you know, synch syncretistically, everything is homogenized, everything goes. And, you know, we went through, we've gone through several phases, but we're in the phase right now where nobody, I don't think there are too many people that recognize just how close biblically we are to the precipice of an unfolding final chapter on earth. You know, you hear these things about cashless society. This was spoken of a long, long time ago. It's in this book, cloaked and veiled in different ways. And yet, it's very, it's very, very rare, especially it will become rarer and more rare to find people who actually have or carry cash on them. And we're headed into an environment where it seems like most people think it's a good idea if you can just walk into a store and scan your palm to be able to buy your groceries because it's convenient. And it seems like a good idea that the advent of the next generation of technology beyond 5G, by the way, will contain some type of uh, augmented or artificial intelligence that will possibly have the ability, as 5G has the ability to uh, harmful waves go into our head, this will have other waves penetrating. This is all not sci-fi, this is a reality. I remember 25 years ago hearing the late Dr. Gene Scott say, when, the, when freedom of speech goes, how many of you were here when he said that? Do you think there's still freedom of speech? Because even me, standing here, and I've said nothing but reading from the Bible or mentioning certain groups of people could very instantaneously have a whole bunch of people on my back saying, I'm a racist, I'm this, I'm that, but it's God's word. And I, I'm, 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 what I'm trying to tell you is we have become forgetful. It has happened in Britain, and it's happened here. Do you realize most of our major cities, 
at the heart of every downtown, there used to be a church. And that wasn't just some pretty building. It was a place where people gathered every single week. Now, I'm not going to berate you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, because those of you who are here are here. But I'm giving you an idea of why it irks me when I see people be complacent. If you're not willing to fight, make known that it matters to you. And that doesn't just stand for your freedom of worship, which may be short-lived in the near future. It doesn't just stand for your freedom of speech, which we know every day people are being silenced and censured and deplatformed. And it's very easy now. If a group of people doesn't like you anymore, your history, you're written off, you're canceled. And you tell me that that's a God-fearing society. You tell me that that's a people who actually think, like I just referenced about going into a store and paying with the palm of your hand. If those people actually knew what's in here, in this book, they'd say, not, not over my dead body. You don't have my palm. You're not putting anything in my body. You're not implementing or experimenting on me. It's not happening. Why? Because I read the book. Now, you know, this is the problem. Because people don't believe this book and what's in it, it's very easy to just dismiss it and treat it as something very casual. And that's why I really am going to tell you as I head into the next message, I really believe we are Manasseh. Manasseh is America. I'll try and show you how we get there and how we morph into this. But just remember one thing. I said this last week. We could have been a part of Ephraim. England was here monopolizing and basically trying to put their stake in the ground here. But God had a plan, and I believe America is part of that plan. No, absolutely no question, as I referenced in a previous message as well, those people who fled from England and from the Netherlands to come here, for what purpose? Did they come here because they were bored in their country, because they didn't like it where they were? They came here for religious freedom. And when you forget that purpose of the founding of this country, you have lost it all. Now, take a group of people who have no frame of reference and care not only not for this book, but now the label is you are a supremacist if you are a Christian. See, these are the things I'm watching happen. Losing our freedom of speech, the ability to freely worship, freely worship, while others who have, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it, who have sunk into moral and social depravity get the free pass and platform to tell everybody about their depravity, and we should all <laughs> applaud about it because that's what America has become, forgetful. And if you don't think that's a problem, this will only usher in things quicker at a faster rate as the global powers that be Strangely enough, I'll tell you something weird. I was listening to, of all people, is a Catholic, I believe he's an archbishop. Now you know me, my, my stand on things. This man made a lot of sense. He said, the push to bring this one world order, to bring everything under one banner, which begins with what? Money, policies. And it's happening. It's, this is not like crazy stuff. This is happening. And if you don't think so, please read the news. Look at what's going on. And you tell me that this is, this is all orchestrated by the Spirit of God. The tearing down, as I said, of our children, the corrupting of our children, the tearing down of the definition of a man, the tearing down of the definition of a woman, all designed to strip individuals of their identity, to bring on greater perversion. So are we in a bad place? Absolutely. And it, the only hope, I'm sorry to say it like this, but I can't apologize. The only hope we have is that America, which used to be the superpower, we've become impotent, we've become scared, afraid, we've become like, you know, it used to be Give me two seconds here to give my two cents. It used to be you could have a comedian come on stage 
and do his skit, and he'd aim for everybody. There was nobody that was excluded, and we all laughed because it was poking fun at everybody. Now, God forbid a comedian should make a joke, and it's, 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 a, very, it's a very sensitive society. Oh, uh, you're wearing pink nail polish. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, you're racist. Because I'm wearing pink nail polish. I'm, I'm now in that category of crazy people. That's what we've become. And, and how did we get there? Again, it's a small swath of society that has been given a big voice. And they keep telling you, if we don't stand, if we don't keep, America needs to get back to God. America needs to start praying. And you know what? You used to hear this in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. Pray for revival. No, I don't pray for revival. I pray for America, for all of us to repent. And I, I mean that in, in the biblical way, not the mea culpa, mea culpa stuff, to stop dead in your tracks of whatever you're doing and recognize you're going the wrong way and begin to follow Christ because the Bible says Christ is the way, he is the door, he is the light. So you figure out when I'm talking about this, just look at history and what's happened and the erosion of everything. I don't necessarily agree with, uh, she is the sister of a, what I call a loony Christian, but she wants to make movies that are more wholesome and, you know, more uh, Christocentric. Well, I'll take that, even if they're what I call honey and uh, bubblegum Christian, I'll take that any day over the perversity and the wokeness and everything else that's happening in society because nobody seems to be looking at this and saying, we are going the wrong way. We have gone so far the wrong way, I'm not even sure we can come back, but it will take not just me standing here lamenting over this, but it will take people genuinely struck at their core, smitten in their conscience by the Holy Spirit to recognize we have become such a destitute, empty, vapid people to prioritize the things that are now so important. And where is God in this equation? Now, God gave us in this land that document by our founding fathers to ensure certain inalienable rights. My question to people is, have we really become forgetful? Have we really become that complacent and that careless? Now, when I get into the Manasseh message, God willing, next week, I'll show you enough of where we were, where we started, where you could have a president in office making an address to the American people, being able to not just say, and God bless America, which seems to be nothing but a puppeteer line at the close of a speech, but a speech that is steeped in godly concepts, a speech that actually reached down to the soul of American people and provided hope, dignity, and clarity for a burgeoning nation. This day and age, if you should, if you should say God, do you, you realize that? That every presidential speech ends with, and may God bless America. That's the only time you're going to hear God because the rest of the time, it is Godless. And guess what? Where your leader is, that's where the people follow. And you might say, well, not me, but there are more of those than there are of me and you. So what do you do about that? And I say to you, pray. Don't, don't make it a, uh, you know, I, I sit down, I think, oh, I'm going to pray a little bit. No, pray earnestly and beyond prayer. Just remember one thing. If they can silence any one person, well, they can silence the person that's out there, but they can equally silence you. Remember the quote of Niemöller. You know, first they came for these people and they did nothing. Then they came for these people and did nothing. You know, and then they came for me and there was no one to come and help me. I'm giving you my version. That's where we're at. Christian people need to stand strong in the faith, not be forgetful, become fully full of faith, 
standing strong, not cowering in fear, not reverting to this perversity or thinking, well, this is just the way it is. I must accept it. I, as your pastor, I refuse. I refuse what's being put on me. I refuse to see godlessness that I should somehow, I, I need to accept it because that is what the majority is peddling on me. I refuse it. I refuse it for our children. I refuse it for you. Maybe those of you who, I'm sorry to say, don't have the backbone or you don't want to stir the pot. But let me tell you something. If you don't start having some backbone and stirring the pot, and I don't mean with violence or corruption or perversity, we will be silenced as a people. And if you don't think that's a possibility, just look at the history I've shown you. All you've got to do is look at England, what England used to be. England, if you've ever been there, and I have, I've traveled many countrysides, and I've been to very remote places. There's always been a church. It didn't matter if it was Catholic, if it was Anglican, or eventually a Protestant. It didn't matter. There was always a church somewhere, and there were always people in the churches. Do you know that in today's society, that ideology is basically gone. Churches are looked at as a reliquary, something of antiquity, no longer a gathering place for people like-minded in Christ, but rather something to just look at and maybe appreciate the architecture and move on. That's what God has become there. I'm not sure. I cannot speak for all. I can only speak for myself and say, I will stand with my last breath and say, if you don't think that it's possible because all things with God are possible. If you don't think it's possible that we can regain our nation and regain our stand and regain our God-given rights that we have been granted that are slowly ebbing and being taken away, well, then I have news for you. God's not the God that the Bible says he is because it says with God all things are possible. So I hope we haven't become forgetful. I hope we haven't become like that, but we'll see, God willing, in next week's message if I can bring that across, and maybe, God willing, this message will spread to enough ears that people will hear and say, you know, I need to look into some of the things. If you're not familiar with what I've said, I need to investigate and I need to look into what she's saying, because some of us, some people don't want to read the news. They don't want to listen to the news, and I'm not talking about mainstream, which only has selective reporting, but come and look for news that is being freely reported by real reporters, but freely reported without uh, this filtering of what they can or can report, cannot report to see if what I'm saying is not true. And I believe you'll come back and say, you're right, Pastor. Now, what can we do about it? Well, I'm telling you, begin with stand strong in Christ, having done all which we haven't, but having done all, therefore stand. But in the meantime, keep trusting God and look unto him alone who is able, by the way, to accomplish the impossible in this land once more. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.